Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Philippe Lofer. I'm the CEO uh, for the brand called Katia within the system. And uh, I'm also uh, vice president in charge of research and development. So what I want to explain to you today is the session. It's about design empowerment. So how can technology, science, research help to empower the designer? We had a wonderful session this morning. I recall the theme of today, moving in a sustainable world. That's the topic we're addressing. And it's time to speak about design empowerment. First of all, I would like to tell you my um, relation to design. I'm not a designer per, let's say, per experience, but I love this moment when things are raising from invisible, which is inside the brain of the people, imagination, to actual design. This is for me uh, like uh, an instant of magic, uh, going from invisible to visible. So I talked to myself and I said, uh, I would like and love to be a magician myself. So it's why I'm in the information technology world, helping the designer to become a magician. So as we've learned this morning, the designer, they're facing a great deal of complexity uh, and a great need to help to accompany them in their endeavor and in the transformation of the world. We saw this morning that the uh, car industry is transforming itself. Uh, we cannot speak anymore about car maker. We speak about mobility experience uh, designers and makers. So if I tell you about social innovation technology, if I talk to you about scientific uh, multidiscipline, multi-scale simulation and solution on a unique platform, this is what I want you to discover this afternoon. So it's going to be a session I'm going to share with uh, two industrial people, and Cecile is going to help me moderate that session. So as I mentioned to you, you know, uh, the connection with the designer, you know, is uh, for me extremely important. This is a, a Nobel Prize that was saying, you know, I'll let you read the sentence. Uh, the design transformed the product of your imagination into a real experience. So, imagine and shape the connected world. Uh, I would never have shown this slide to my customers uh, even three years ago. These are going to be the experiences of tomorrow. Uh, you see on the top, uh, on, the, on the left uh, bottom part of the slide, you see, for example, a fleet of aircrafts uh, flying together. Uh, Airbus is intending to create the uh, freeway, motorway of, of, uh, of, uh, of the air. So this introduces a new complexity, which how do you manage what is called systems of system? Just to give you an example, uh, how do you uh, construct new buildings, you know, that are going to be 100% 3D printed? This is a building you see on the bottom of the slide. And how do you transform uh, fuel-empowered mobility into electrical mobility? You saw one of the first... Uh, um, vertical takeoff aircraft here on the right side as well, the bottom right side. So these are the designs of tomorrow, and we need to help, of course, these, um, the designer to accomplish that. By the way, transformation is already happening. I quoted here for you companies who are, uh, I wouldn't call them car makers, these are experienced electrical or autonomous experience makers. And, uh, well, they're easily located in Europe, a lot of them in the United States, and I can tell you every two, three months, there is a new company that appears. They have a common endeavor, which is to revolutionize the mobility. So we understood this morning that Renault and BMW are going the same way, but these are companies that are created from scratch, startup, and they don't ask themselves questions. They just go and make it happen. And by the way, all those startups, they're looking for a platform, a design, engineering, manufacturing platform. And all those companies you see here on the slide, they have selected the 3D experience platform. I'm going to make you understand why. Some of the challenges, and I think I loved this morning the, um, the session that was um, asking the audience the right questions. There are new questions that are coming because we're uh, transforming the mobility. Um, New customer expectation, comfort, we saw this morning life uh, inside the vehicle, but also new competition. I'm just going to, to, to 
tell some of those that are written here. How do you electrify the powertrain from fuel consumption to electrical powertrain? Sophistication inside the car. The car becomes a platform. The car becomes a software platform. Uh, if you go inside the Tesla, the first thing you'll see in the Tesla is this big screen in the middle, and that embeds a lot, a lot of software. So these are some of the challenges, some of the questions that uh, raise and that needs to be answered by the mobility uh, providers. Uh, new material, we heard yesterday Kengokuma, soft materials. I'm sure you heard about a prototype that was made by BMW called Gina. It was some years ago, which was a car made of soft materials. So these are some of the challenges that um, those companies are facing. Overall, they're also moving from design to a whole experience. And I like this way to present an experience because it covers the whole uh, value stream from the upstream thinking, which, which is uh, the concept behind the car, the dynamic, uh, I would say the look and feel. But the first thing that you experiment when you're with Tesla is go inside the dealership. And when you go inside the dealership, the first thing you do is you configure, you customize your car. And uh, the car you see on the screen is exactly the car that will be engineered and produced for you. So it's a unique moment where uh, the customer sees how the car will be engineered and manufactured. Then you are inside the car, of course you um, see this uh, I would say a uh, window to the, to the future and windows to the whole software and to your applications with which you are um, conducting your vehicle. So it goes then to engineering, manufacturing. I don't know if you worked through a plant inside Tesla. It's completely, it's 95% automated. Very few human beings inside, uh, inside the plant. And of course, when you're using the car, you know, uh, Tesla has designed those power uh, superchargers that allow you to charge your vehicle in 20, 25 minutes. So it's a holistic experience from when you enter inside the uh, dealership to the engineering, production, usage of the car and the infrastructure. So that's um, a typical example of transformation. At the same time, we saw in information technology, um, we see uh, strong limitations today uh, limited collaboration uh, environment inside uh, the companies. Just the way to give uh, visibility, data visibility to uh, all the stakeholders in this value stream is getting a challenge for some companies. Um, which one could I uh, reuse? No intelligent reuse of the existing data. All the OEMs, they have been creating cars for years and uh, uh, whereby uh, each time a car is recreated, you know, things are reinvented. So there is no extensive reuse today. So I could quote, you know, uh, 12 of those. Uh, this is typically what we see in the industry currently. And I can tell you the companies that I, you saw, the electrical vehicle companies and autonomous vehicle companies, when they start from scratch, they don't have these limitations. Why? Because there are technology trends in the information technology that are helping resolve those issues. Uh, platform, you know, the, um, the future, uh, the, the companies making future are the ones who are owning a platform. Look at Google, look at Uber, Uber is a platform. Look at Amazon, the marketplaces that Amazon provide, it's a unique platform and from the, when, when you click on the button to order something, to the delivery, all this has been automated. It's robots that are working and automating things to deliver to you in time, in quality, the product. So platform is a key transformation driver of the industry. And I'm going to uh, insist of some of them in the reminder of my session. So the platform, of course. Uh, the need to, when you create an experience, you need simultaneously to design and play the experience. So let's call it for the moment design and simulation. And the third one is uh, the designer cannot solve all those topics on his own. You need to have assistant. And uh, we have been creating the CAD industry. CAD is said to be computer-aided design. But you, when you look at how the designers are working today, today, how much does the computer help you? It just helps you transform your idea that's in your brain into digital uh, mathematical models. What about if the system would tell you, uh, given 
the problem you want to solve, solve which shape or which system you're going to use. So this is one transformational point I want to discuss, which is moving from computer-aided design, CAD, to cognitive augmented design. And I'm going to explain you very simply what it is about. The first thing, and there are five stages. You know when people are developing uh, autonomous vehicle, there are five types of autonomous vehicles. It's exactly the same here on the information technology. You have five uh, degrees of autonomous design. I call it like this. So the first one is, you know, having an exact representation of the reality, a mathematical representation of the reality. And you know that Dassault system has been in this uh, business since a long time. So we understand today that we are not in a movie. What you need to represent inside the computer is the exact shape and the exact mathematics. Uh, when you simulate something, it needs to represent the exact physics phenomenon. So this is what we have been working for years and years. Then we said to ourselves from exact geometry, we need to move to exact design. Exact design is to capture the know-how of the designer. When you create a typical shape, you have a list of operations that you're doing. Why don't we capture that list of operations and reuse it later on? That state of the art, Katia, today. And this leads us to what we call morphable engineering car. And I'm going to show you an example in a minute, which is when you design a gearbox, when you design uh, an interior of a body panel, you do it once, and you want to reapply the same technique to a new style of the car. Well, why don't you exactly reduce and morph what you did for the previous car to the new car? There is a company in the world that does that very well, called uh, Toyota, who is, uh, in fact, creating uh, the vehicles in a completely semi-automatic way. And I have a short video to explain you how that works. What you see here is not a human. There is no human besides the computer. Behind the computer, this is a robot. So the robot, what it does, it picks what we call a design that was used in the past. This is a typical gearbox. And it starts on a new vehicle. So the new vehicle starts very simply with a design space and a need for uh, different ratios for the shift. And what the robot does here, it creates for you, in fact, the right uh, mechanical system, the pinions that are going to fulfill the design intent. So you're not, as a designer, designing the result. You're giving the system the specification, the problem you want to solve, and the robot solves it. And it generates a drawing automatically. It generates the manufacturing process. So that's typically uh, generation one of CATIA, which is morphable uh, engineering. But we want to go further. We want to go what we call experiential engineering. We are not designing parts and products anymore. We are designing an experience. So um, the first thing is to leverage the patrimony of what your company has done in the past. The two companies we saw this morning, BMW and uh, Renault, they have created terabytes of digital data representing their vehicle. So why don't we leverage this patrimony? Why don't we learn the machine to understand how this was made and have the machine help the next uh, car designer and the next mobility experience designer? That's what we call enterprise experience. The second one is a fusion between design and science. I had a chance to uh, write a blog on my LinkedIn uh, account which uh, raised the question, does design drive science or does science drive design? This is a good question. And we believe that both should be simultaneously done. So with what I'm going to show you, we want to transform the designer into a designer assisted by many scientific people. And this can happen thanks to computer or cognitive augmented design. So let's look at uh, some um, example of that. Before, I wanted to introduce you to one of the uh, uh, industrial person I'm working with. This is Nick Rogers. He's VP Group Engineering at Jaguar Land Rover. And what he writes is uh, very simple. This is the last paragraph. The historical division between design and CAE means when, when you simulate analysis is uh, going to disappear, must disappear. 
So this is really the marriage between the designer and the scientist. And uh, those divisions were largely a product of the labor and skill-intensive tools that have been available until now. So this gentleman sees the productivity of engineering multiplied by 10 if we can solve this problem. And this is what we have been doing with the 3D experience. So this is a mathematical representation of the time needed to design. So you see that's the effort that you put in designing systems um, from concept to final design. At the same time, you need to know that, for example, when you're creating a vehicle, a front end of the vehicle, there are 10, 20 scientists in the background who are crashing virtually the car or who are studying the noise vibration of the car. And this is done, I would say, nearly sequentially. So when you end up, when you sum the cost of all those, it's tremendous. Designer creates uh, the first version of the car, analysts give feedback, they create the second version, third version, etc. Very sequential. What about if you would have, as a designer, what we call a cobot, so uh, computing for you and giving you instantaneous feedback on what you're designing? This is what we call experiential engineering. An example, it's a typical example I like to take which is a famous problem of engine lubrification. So usually this process here takes uh, the iteration, takes two weeks, one loop takes two weeks. Two weeks to design those, uh, of course, components, assemble them together, and have the scientist running the simulation, and have a second loop, third loop. So the convergence of this engine lubrification is extremely tedious. With the three experience, well, when you create, inside Katia, the engine, you have a little uh, cobot that comes up and tells you if the lubrication of your system is going to be correct or not correct, and give you advices how to modify that. So at those companies, we were able to drive, in fact, the lubrification uh, um, engineering of this powertrain from two weeks to two days. This is what uh, it takes you know, to, uh, um, to, to engineer uh, the proper way. Now, let me explain you how this uh, generative design technology works. It's very simple. Uh, instead of designing the solution, you're stating the problem to the system. The problem you want to solve usually is you have some KPIs that you need to address with the part or the system you're creating. So it can be the weight, it can be the cost, it can be uh, the material, it can be, you know, three, four, ten KPIs that you want to reach. And then you, you have what we call a design space. Always the designer, when he designs the gearbox, he's told this is a packaging of the vehicle, this is where you can express your design. So what if there would be a robot inside the system that would take into account those KPIs, the design space, the environment in which you're working, and ask you for the manufacturing processes that you're addressing? So it can be 3D printing, the most modern one, additive manufacturing, it can be milling, cast and forge, or composites. And come out with a solution, with a solution that is viable, that is already verified, certified, and tested. This is what we are seeing in the industry. So here is a typical case. This is a part designed by a human. It's a part that connects, actually, the, uh, the nacelle of the engine to the fuselage, a, a really a critical part. And so this is designed by a human. And uh, well, this is designed, the three designs here are done by robots, software robots. So the input of that is a design space, KPIs, and the output is a part that can be milled, that can be cast and forged, or that can be 3D printed. And that happens in seconds. So this is really an example of transformation of computer-aided design to cognitive augmented design. And it's in operation today. Uh, this is a quote from one of the company who has been transforming their way to design from an interactive way of doing things, manual way, to a fully automated way. So you see here, not only the design time was divided by four, but you see the weight reduction. Uh, those parts are done in titanium, so the raw material is costly. And of course, the weight, I think we discussed that this morning. What about if we could remove uh, unnecessary weight on the vehicle? 
for an aircraft is even more sensitive. So 30% to 70% of weight reduction. This is what happened. It's currently happening in the industry. So I have a small example, of course, couldn't resist to have a video showing the robot in action. So the robot here is going to take a system that was designed by a human. So this was completely interactively designed by a designer. It was two designers. And, well, it's going to compute what is called the envelope of all that. And it's going to tell, well, I'm going to get, that, get rid of that shape. And I'm going to analyze, you know, what is the problem, the mechanical problem you want to solve. So this is an articulated system with, I think, 12 joints. And uh, the parts are, um, are strained, you know, uh, with a given position in the vehicle. And then you try to apply forces, torques, to tell the system this is what the part is going to be used for. So instead of stating a solution, you state the problem that you want to solve as a designer. And I'm, come back in, and I'm now coming back to the magic I was telling you uh, before. I always considered that the designer is doing like a magician. So here, you know, what we decided is that there should be a magician inside a computer and telling you, generating for you the exact shape, uh, either to be 3D printed or either to be milled, depending on your production needs. So this is exactly, you know, what generative design is about. It's about having cobots inside the system assisting you on a day-by-day -day cases. And by the way, I think you will see here the, uh, the weight reduction is extremely, uh, extremely uh, consequent. And this works, you know, for not only for mechanical problems, mechanical static, it works for dynamic problems. You could generate here a crash-safe a crash uh, structure of a hood like this one uh, within seconds with this generative design. So, this is what is in the system today. This is what is in 3D experience today. And I want to take you a little bit further. So I'm going to run the first uh, video of cognitive augmented design here. So let's assume here we want to design, to engineer a front frame, this front frame of the motorbike. Okay, so let's get rid of the part and the system understands that you want to connect the two pieces here, the mechanical pieces, to the other one. So the first thing the system creates, it's, I would say, a general shape that would fit, you know, this connection, a geometric connection between the parts. Then, of course, it's going to look at how the part is fixed to the extremities and what are the mechanical scenarios. So what are the forces, the torques that are going to be, um, uh, to be applied during the usage of the motorbike? And the system starts to optimize. The system starts to generate the best possible shape. And you see here, uh, if a human, a human would never have created that shape. Uh, this is a shape that is going to be, at the minimal weight, uh, optimized manufacturing in a minimum of time, and uh, being able to um, sustain the scenario that the part should apply to. And the robot did not generate one alternative. It generated here, I think in this case, it was more than 200 alternatives. And uh, uh, compared to the KPI that you want, in fact, to privilege, the weight of the KPI, you can select the right um, cobot alternative for optimum design, for uh, given the supplier that you have. So the advantage of a cobot is that it's not one uh, alternative that it generates, it's uh, hundreds or thousands. So as a designer, uh, as a designer, you're not anymore thinking about solving a problem. You are selecting the right cobot that will give you the right answer. So that completely changes the mindset of a designer. So we're going to see here, you all think that this part is uh, uh, plain. Well, this part is hollow and has been uh, completely... Um, it looks like a, a neck, of a, a neck of, a, of a swan, in fact. When you... It, it's really impressive when you see the robot work. In fact, the result of what the robot is doing is often very close to what nature would do. So that's a little bit of forward thinking. So that's, uh, you know, what we call uh, generative design or cognitive augmented design. The second thing I want to show you here is uh, perfect marriage, perfect blending 
between design and sciences. So here, what you see is, uh, well, um, as a designer, you're uh, optimizing, I would say, the outfit and the look of the wing here. But there is a cobot that continuously, in the background, computes the airflow. Because at the end, the car, you don't need it just to be nice looking. You need to have the right uh, penetration in the, in the air. So this is actually, you know, a designer. And by the way, uh, we are currently creating new ways of interact with the system. We are creating new ways to operate the system. Uh, as I said yesterday, we are completely uh, fed up to have 3D represented on the flat screen and have to use a mouse or even touch on the screen. So here we have teach the system to um, learn the um, motion of the hands of the designer. So doing it bigger, doing it smaller, scaling in, scaling out, move to the left, move to the right, move to the up. So again, it, the designer here is like a chef d'orchestre in French, a conductor, I think it's in English. And he um, drives the design, but the cobot at the same time is giving him information about the fluid uh, aspiration you know, of, the, of, 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 this, of his design. So he has an immediate feedback. We are going further. Uh, we are also um, experimenting today new ways to orchestrate those cobots. Uh, and this is an orchestration that is done through the mindset of the people. So it's capturing, in fact, all the electrical impulse, impulses that are starting from the brain. Here it's, we, we know that you know, the, all the big IT companies in the world, so Google, are working on that, but it's for text messaging. Here it's really you know, to teach 3D. So actually, this lady here uh, is driving the system. You see what she is doing. She's again, you know, telling to the system, not telling, uh, thinking to the system the main gestures, left, right, up, down, and click. These are the five, um, five uh, senses, five uh, thinking processes we learn to the computer. So this is going to be really a revolution because it's completely changed the interaction between the designer and the computer. Voilà, so this is uh, basically what I wanted to mention to you. So moving basically from interactive design into cognitive augmented design, like the autonomous vehicle, there's going to be, in some months, years from now, autonomous design. And the second message you should get out of this is the interaction between the computer and between the designer.